Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. He is risen indeed. What a glorious day. Our scripture passage this morning is taken from Mark 16, reading verses 1 through 14. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that might, they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll this stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. So trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on that first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they didn't believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form of to two of them while they were walking in the country. They returned and reported it to the rest, but they didn't believe it either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had been risen. May God bless our reading of his holy word. The first Easter Sunday was so good because Saturday had been so bad. The enemies of Christ were confident that they had put an end to the movement. His work was now a total failure. On Saturday, Christ was in a grave. Life is over for him. His tongue had been silenced and the miracles were finished. On Sunday, on Saturday, the only re recorded activity was by the Pharisees, the enemies of Christ. They were no longer concerned with Jesus, but about the disciples. In Matthew 27, it says the next day, the one of the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he is still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Their only concern were those pesky disciples. They were concerned that they might steal his body, but no concern was necessary. Because you see, the disciples were in meltdown mode. They had scattered and they were hiding in every available section of Jerusalem for fear of the cross, which might have their name on it. Saturday had no courage, no hope. None of the disciples were thinking, so what are we going to say when we see Jesus tomorrow? Or I wonder what Jesus is going to look like tomorrow. No one was thinking they would see Jesus on Sunday or Saturday. It was just utter despair. You would think someone would have remembered one of the many times that Jesus promised that he would come back on the third day. Statements like the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. Wouldn't you think that someone would have remembered this and do a little bit of math? Let's see. He was killed yesterday. Today is Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday. Okay. One day, two day. Tomorrow is the third day. You know, fellas, I think we ought to get up early tomorrow morning but nobody connected those dots. Saturday was no hope, no courage. And on Sunday, they came to embalm him, not to talk to him. In Mark 16, one to three, it says when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Siloam went to the tomb, and their intention was to anoint Jesus' body with spices. That sure doesn't sound like an Easter parade, does it? There's no victory in the faces or hearts of the followers of Jesus. It may be Saturday, Sunday morning, but they were stuck in a hopeless Saturday. Do you ever feel like you're stuck in a hopeless Saturday? Do you ever feel like you just can't find anything good? Every day is a rainy day. The sky is always gray. There's no silver linings. And the story always has an unhappy ending. There's just no more courage, no hope, no reason to be positive. Ever feel like your world is stuck in that Saturday mode? Then when you put your hope in something or someone, either they let you down or worst of all, they die. Excuse me. In the end, you die. And death seems to have that ultimate insult. I mean, you do your best the best you can. You pay your dues to this world. You do your best to make a difference. You try to do what's right. You try to stay healthy. You try to eat right. You try to exercise, follow the rules. But nobody outlives death. I don't care who you are. From the wealthiest to the poorest. Everyone dies a death in this world. And there's just something about that which sucks our lives into a Saturday state of mind. You find yourself at a funeral and it hits you. This is it. I can't outrun it. I can't do anything to avoid it. It's going to happen someday. And that is just utterly, utterly stinks. I believe if you don't have the ans an answer for the grave, then you're stuck in Saturday mode for your whole life. I mean, you may have your moments, but if you don't have an answer for the grave, let me tell you that you're stuck Saturday is there and it feels real and without having hope. We don't find any reason to be joyous in Easter Sunday. But every single person has, a, has an Easter Sunday rejoicing day because Easter gives us a promise. Death is not the end. It is simply like an exit ramp from this life to the best life. Have you ever thought about how you will face your final moments? It's not a pleasant thought, but what would it take for you to be able in your final moments, not to cower from death, but to face it, if not with excitement, then with courage, that we would face death unafraid. Let me tell you now how Jesus enables us to do that. He moves us out of a Saturday mentality into a Sunday state of mind. He will take us from Saturday where death has defeated life into Sunday where life has defeated death. And he moves us from that last day of death to the first day of life. And all of Easter's, all the Easter story tells this. One great story is the one about Mary Magdalene in John 11, where it says, Now Mary sat outside the tomb, and she wept and bent over to look at the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one with the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she said, they have taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they have put him. So can we pause at that for a moment? Mary Magdalene buried more than a friend that weekend. She buried the only person who ever helped her. We don't know a lot about her. And some people make wild speculations about her. But look at this one sentence from Mark. Now when Jesus arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven demons. In scripture, the number seven is symbolizes completion. And so Mary Magdalene was completely afflicted. We don't know what afflicted her. It might have been some type of dependency or depression, but she was completely afflicted. People avoided her. 
We tend to avoid people like that, don't we? But Jesus didn't. He not only befriended her, he delivered her. And when she came to the tomb and found that the body was gone and that stone was rolled away, it never occurred to her that Jesus was simply following through on what he said he would do. And she missed the miracle. She obviously saw the two angels, but she didn't realize that they were angels and she missed them. There are times in life when despair is so deep and sadness is so thick and the walls are so high that we feel we just can't get out. These are tough times in which we feel like the world is closing in on us. We feel like anything bad is going to happen. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. You say, I'm the lucky one. If there's bad luck to find, I'll find it. You see, God in those situations could send you miracle after miracle and blessing after blessing. And we're told to count them, but it doesn't work because when we're in that Saturday mode, we miss it. And we wonder, what does Jesus do doing those times? But here's your answer. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Do you see what Jesus did? He didn't give up on Mary. Most of us would have. We'd think, look, there's angels sitting and talking to you. The tomb is empty, dog. Come on, Mary, get the message. But Jesus didn't do that. The empty tomb and the angels didn't open her eyes. So Jesus took matters into his own hands and he came and spoke to her. He didn't tell her to get herself together. He didn't tell her to buck up. He spoke to her with tenderness. Mary, why are you crying on this first Easter morn? He came to her like a gentle shepherd. Why would he do this? Well, I'll tell you why, because he's Jesus and Jesus does these things. He's ever patient, ever caring. He's the heart of God. He's so patient with you and I. The prophet Micah asked this question about God. Where is another God like you who pardons the sins of survivors among his people? You cannot stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing mercy. Once again, you will have compassion on us. Once again, Jesus will have compassion on you. I know there are people here that hear this this morning that are passing through seasons in their life in which there's great sadness. There's people that are in that valley of despair. There's people that are in that slump of life and they're finding life, just putting one foot in front of the other very hard today. Maybe it's the economy, maybe it's your family, family, maybe it's health, maybe it's a job or lack of it, and maybe it's just one problem too many that you're trying to deal with. At some point when we hit the valley, we tend to think that God must really be mad at us to leave us there. And we start to feel bad, and then feeling bad allows us to get stuck in Saturday road. We think if I really had it together, I would be able to get out of this thing. I'm tired of feeling bad. Then God must be really tired of pulling me out over and over and over again. He's probably just mad at me because here I am stuck once again. But you see, there's stories like this all throughout the Bible. So we know that that's not the case. When we're stuck in Saturday mode, we need to be reminded that God is patient and long suffering for his children. He's more patient with you than you are with yourself. And he comes and he brings you the message that says Saturday has come, it's here, it's today, but Saturdays are always followed by Sundays. Am I wrong? What was yesterday and what's today? Look what happened again. Saturdays are always followed by Sundays. Or as we read in Psalm 30, weeping may go on all night, but joy comes in the morning. So be patient. God is patient. Be patient with yourself. Eventually that season passes and it's Sunday. When the Saturdays come, do what Mary did. Notice her words to the angels. They have taken my Lord away. She just kept calling Jesus her Lord. In tough times, Jesus remained her Lord. 
Anybody can call on Jesus on the good days. But when we're moving through the Saturdays of life, it's not always easy to call Jesus Lord. But when we can continue to call Jesus Lord on the Saturdays, oh, how good it will be when the Sundays come. So listen to the end of this story. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. Listen to her devotion to Jesus. Did you catch what she said? I don't think Mary could have done this. She was so devoted to Jesus that she wanted to get his body and bring it back. But also note, she didn't get the point of what was to happen on day three. And Jesus was so touched by her devotion. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani. When she heard Jesus call her name, she knew who, she, who he was. Someday, we will hear Jesus call our name. And someday in heaven, when you hear Jesus call your name, all the pain of this earth will have been worth it. Someday, let's talk it over in heaven. See if I'm going to if I'm telling you the truth. When you hear Jesus call your name, you'll say whatever struggles it looks like, that he didn't forget you and that he knew you by your name. And when I heard him call my name, it was worth it, you'll be able to say, because I know that God knows me. Listen to your heavenly father, your heavenly king, your heavenly daddy. He knows you and he knows you by your name. He doesn't just see humanity. He sees individuals. He sees us all and he knows us by our names. You call him Lord, he calls you by his name. The Bible says if we're willing to confess his name on earth, he will confess your name in heaven. You hold on to that. And his message to you is this. He has moved the world into Sunday. In your state of mind, it may be Saturday, in your outlook, in your emotions, but actually God has already flipped the calendar page and we're moved out of the state of death and sin and we're moved into an era of life and grace. That move took place over 2,000 years ago. And anyone who wants to follow God from Saturday to Sunday can do so. And we believe that because there is a movement in the tomb containing Jesus on that Sunday morning and the eyes that had fallen shut on the cross opened beneath the shroud and the hands that had fallen limp behind the nails straightened and strengthened beneath the veil. The lips which had grown quiet on Saturday spread into soft, a sm soft smile on Sunday because there was much to smile about. The penalty of sin had been paid it was finished and death had been defanged and turned from dead a dead end street to a simple exit ramp from this life to the next life to the best life it is no longer saturday so saturday's sadness turned to sunday's beauty and the beauty of sunday stood up in the tomb and the beauty of sunday stepped out into the sunday morning and told a person, and then another person. What some of you are hearing him say for the first time in your life, oh, it's Sunday, and I don't have to be afraid of the grave any longer. And I don't have to live in my guilt anymore. My sins are forgiven. Death has been defeated. It's Sunday, and that is incredible. Good news. Let's pray. Lord God, we anxiously await it yesterday for this glorious Sunday morning, for the open tomb, for the risen Christ. Lord, we ask that the risen Christ be the one that guide us. We ask that we joyfully celebrate that empty tomb today that we share the gospel with our family and friends. 
that we come to you ready to do your will. That we always remember that no matter how bad our Saturdays are, Sunday's coming. Be with us this day, Lord. Help us to remember all that you've done for us as we spend time with family and friends celebrating this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you're having a wonderful Easter. I hope you have lots of special time with family and friends. And I will see you next week for our regular service at our regular time. Bye for now.